Hello, everyone, and welcome to another book lecture with the Catholic Information Center. I'm very excited to be here with our good friend, Bishop William Byrne, who you might know better as Father Bill Byrne. And today he's here to talk about his new book, Five Things with Father Bill Byrne, Hope, Humor, and Help for the Soul. Now, you can learn all about Bishop Byrne's esteemed career by reading the video description below, and I encourage you to do so. And I also encourage you to sign up for our e-newsletter, which you can do at CICDC.org, and to follow us on social media so you can stay up to date on all that the CIC has to offer you. And without further ado, I want to hand the screen over to my friend, Bishop Byrne. Thank you very much, and it's great to be with you. I uh, send out my greetings to all the uh, CIC community in a special way, my dear friend, Father Charles Trios. I um, am delighted to be able to talk about my book here, Five Things with Father Bill, Help, Humor, and um, Hope for the Soul. And the book actually came about uh, rather accidentally. The editor of the Catholic Standard, Mark Zimmerman, the Washington Catholic paper, asked me to do a column on uh, various topics. Uh, and we sort of developed the idea of doing a five things. Uh, and so I just wrote them continuously. And before you know it, I had a whole pile of them. And a good friend of mine, um, I would say urged is sort of weak word. It's more like badgered, uh, battered me to uh, put them together in a book. And gratefully, Loyola Press uh, uh, compiled it, edited it, and published it. And so each chapter is a standalone for those of you who haven't read it. Things like five things I learned from my dog or uh, five uh, delightful mysteries of the rosary, five graduation gifts for uh, our seniors, things like that. Everyone's a standalone um, piece. And each one is sort of extracts from daily life uh, ways of seeing God. And, and for me, I believe that that the sweet music of grace is playing all around us all the time. And if we can begin to uh, dial ourselves in, then we begin to see how God communicates, uh, not just in the big ways like the Eucharist and in the sacred scriptures, but in the smallest ways, like how your dog treats you. And, um, and each of these are a manifestation. God is above us, below us, in us outside of us, beyond us. Um, and so they are, they're light in a sense that they deal with, uh, with everyday topics, but they're theologically meaty, I think. There's always a takeaway, a thing to learn um, that'll take us more deeply into discovering God, not just in the beauty of the church and our sacraments and our theology, but in the grandeur of everyday life. There was a, a Gary Marshall was the producer, I think, and director of, of Happy Days and, and Laverne and Shirley. And he, when he was asked once why he made his shows the way he did, he said, my shows are recess, not school. And everyone knows that you can't, if you take a kid and you don't give them recess, they don't learn as well. That in fact, that's an essential part of the, um, one's learning experience. And I feel like I'm not denigrating school in any way. I love to learn and all that. I love my school experience. But the sort of lecture, top-down lecture is often what people's experience of church is. Um, that it's a passive experience of someone handing you something uh, and asking you to believe it. Um, whereas that's not what I think that church should be. I think church should be recess. It should be the time where we get fresh air into our lungs, theological fresh air, where we get um, to be with one another, where we get to uh, be revived for the difficulties of, of a wounded world and the times that we live in. Uh, and so that's what uh, I think, you, you just think about the liturgical experience um, with 
robes and uh, and beautiful music and incense. Everything speaks to it, not just of solemnity, but also of a certain uh, beauty that comes only from leisure and and the enjoyment of life. To take something uh, and to encounter the sacred through beautiful things, uh, and and to look at for the beauty in life. And so I, I'm a firm believer that uh, that our faith experience should be that which revives us. The other thing that um, that's what's most appealing for those we choose to evangelize that uh, a joyful, informative, uh, lively faith that is not just within the walls of a church, but exuding in all that we do and praising and thanking God. Um, I, I love, I have a great devotion to St. Therese of Lisieux. In fact, I've gotten three roses. I've gotten three roses when I've done her novena. And, but to her, the whole image of her being a little flower, of, of noticing that the flower who just by its very being and essence gives praise and glory to God. And I think the, the challenge for each one of us is to ask, do we experience God in that same way? And do, is it clear in us uh, to others who may not know us or our faith that something's different about how we live and how we move and have our being? So that's what the book was uh, essentially about, was just to find these, um, you know, five ways to be um, romantic every day beyond Valentine's Day, birthday gift ideas, uh, things for vacations. Each of these um, is is a way. So when I, when I look at, for example, I'll just give you a glance at the first chapter. It's the five things I learned from my dog. And I wrote it after my dog, um, my dog Maggie had passed away. And, and I'll just give an example. The number one, that she doesn't judge. Mag me, Maggie uh, saw me in my most personal moments, trying to exercise and collapsing on the floor. Uh, and she never looked in disgust at me. She just looked at me with love. She fall, saw me for all my wonder, not my blunder. So the, the next one is to forgive. If I have to go out to dinner and leave her alone, Maggie didn't slam doors when I arrived home. If my meetings went long and delayed, she wasn't passive aggressive. She was a bundle of tail wagging, welcome home, I love you, um, uh, furry forgiveness. Grudges get us nowhere, certainly not to heaven. The third thing is Maggie seeks balance, helps me seek balance. I like to, uh, Maggie likes to eat, I like to eat. Maggie likes to walk, I like to walk. Now it's Zelly is my latest incarnation. Uh, and so she helps me have balance. Finally, Maggie, uh, and Zelly and all dogs never complain. Uh, if we have to go outside, she um, um, she never complained if things were difficult or challenging. She just followed. And finally, any dog, when I ask them to get in the car, doesn't say, where are we going? How long is it going to take? What are we going to do? Um, she just is like happy to be there. And and so it is, if, if we're hopping into the station wagon of God's love, we tend to ask and make it conditional. Well, wow, what's, what, well, I did all these things and you didn't do this for me, whereas the Lord is inviting us just to say, get in the back seat and trust me. And therein lies an essential, I think the most essential grace that I've received from my dogs is that notion of like total dependence based in complete trust. Uh, and all through the pandemic and, and even into today, we've been in very challenging times, but it doesn't mean that we, we should forsake, uh, like feel forsaken. In fact, we should feel um, faithful and blessed and to see what God wants us, uh, wants of us in this time. You know, one of the things that's most important is that we, we tend to see joy as a destination or happiness as a place. If I, if I get that job, if I graduate from this place, if my kids get out of the house or into graduate school or into high school, the high school that I want them to be, then I'll be happy. And that's not true because as soon as they get into high school, you're going to be worrying about college. Um, you're then going to worry about, are they going to find the right person? Is there, that, that's never, it's an illusory goal. What in fact is happiness is an, a byproduct 
of living well and living today well, not just in the broad strokes, but in the smallest interactions of how we deal with coworkers and families and whether or not we take it out of them in any way. Because none of that is the place for a discipleship. And it's certainly not going to win anybody to the love of Jesus Christ. So five things with Father Bill is sort of a practical homespun uh, version of, of a theology that is ancient and beautiful. And that is that God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. And that that its culmination is not just to get us to heaven, but as the revelation says, the formation, creation of a new heaven and a new earth now today. So it's this ongoing on unfolding of the kingdom of God, of which we are charged to bring about. Um, and so that's what I offer you. I, I would love to hear if people had questions or uh, thoughts or comments or Yes, we have a couple of questions that people have sent in. Um, one question we have from a viewer is, how do you go about choosing something to give up for Lent? Um, he goes on to talk a little bit about, he had told his priest one year what he gave up for Lent, and the priest roasted him. So how can we pick something to give up for Lent where you know the priest isn't going to roast us on our, our selection? Uh, well, first of all, it's none of the priest's business. So... Uh, keep it to yourself or tell the people that you love for accountability. But if you're looking for affirmation, this is tea, by the way. Um, and then, then you're going about it the wrong way. You know, I, I, I think that what you have to do is figure out where, where in my life is the Lord asking me to give me a gift. Um, and so in my hectic life right now, I have asked for, I think the Lord was asking me to give him a little more silence. Uh, I'm not a TV watcher, but here I suddenly live by myself and I tend to watch the news or whatever. And so I found myself saying, no, 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 no. I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to not have any electronics in my, as, unless I need them. Uh, and, and it was a, a lovely discovery to eat dinner with a book. Um, and so I think it's to find out what the gift that the Lord wants to give you and then in that, you'll find out what he's asking you to make room for in your life by what you give up. That's so good. And, and just such simple advice and, and kind of a theme of your book, too. You know, you break, you, you recognize that people seem to respond really well to that format of, you know, taking a subject and breaking it, you know, out into five takeaways and, and the simplicity of that um, in a world that's so, you know, complex. And um, I think that's great. So when you wrote this book, and correct me if I'm wrong, this is your first published works. Um, what did it feel like that your first book that you wrote and had published won or tied with um, another book for the gold medal under the Catholic category for the seventh annual Illumination Book Awards? How did you feel about that? Well, I don't think you have to say tied with anything because it still won it. So let's just say you won the book award. Well, what really broke my heart is that Pope Francis's book, one silver medal to my gold. So I, my first thought was his self-esteem. I didn't want him to, um, to feel hurt. So the, the big, I'm number one foam fingers that I was about to order, I canceled the order because I didn't, I didn't want to hurt his esteem. Um, you know, the whole thing was a, a work of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and so it sort of chuckled because the, the book actually came out the day after I was announced as a bishop. So Within 24 hours, I was had a, uh, a book released, and I was announced to be the Bishop of Springfield, the, the ordinary of Western Massachusetts. So um, it, was, uh, it was fun and exciting, but I, I really have to say that um, I, I, don't, it wasn't, I don't take a lot of credit for it. I think it was sort of an accident all along the way that I got somebody who got me to write these articles. Somebody also got me to publish them. Left to my own devices, I would be, you know, like, I don't know, not accomplishing things, but with God's help through other people, it's amazing. Always such humility. Um, I have one audience member who wants to know, you know, how is Zelly? And they want you to uh, give your dog a hug from their family. I will, I wonder who that is. I'm sure there's probably a lot of mercy people. She's right around here. I don't know where she is, but she's doing great. There's a, um, 
Western Massachusetts is beautiful. And there are tons. We went up on a big hike. I had a priest friend up from Washington, and we went on a big hike on Monday up uh, Mount Tom. We've been to Berkshires. So Zelly is thriving. Um, she, in the, all through the chance, if you go to any desk, there's likely to be a treat bag. So I'm having to, um, we're working on her, uh, on her physique and mine too. <laughs> um, so that's why we need the hikes. She just wanted to get spanks, but I said, no, that's not the answer, darling. You need to be healthy. All right. <laughs> um, I, I just love your humor. Doggy your spanks. Humor. Um, and I think this is a good uh, segue into the next question that I have for you um, from that was sent in to us. So you're a story guy. Um, you tell great stories. And I feel like there's a story around the foreword of your book. What, how, how did this come about that, you know, actress Roma Donnie from Touched by an Angel, what was the, the conversation you and your publisher had to settle on that being the, the author of your foreword. So when um, Roma and her husband, Mark Burnett, uh, they have devoted a lot of money and energy into creating uh, faith and fam family friendly entertainment uh, through their light workers. And they produced a whole series on AD the Bible. They did um, the on the Acts of the Apostles and I did a series of videos uh, through the Archdiocese of Washington uh, with a guy, a friend, Christopher Baker, who used to work there, uh, called The Catholic Take to sort of elucidate on the scene of the Last Supper to explain our Eucharistic theology, little shorts. And so when I did that, and then she came to town and we, um, she invited me to lunch from having done all these things. And then I went out to uh, California. I was visiting friends of mine. And she invited me to lunch at her Malibu cliffside. Yeah, that was totally fun. Um, mansion overlooking the sea where she referred to, oh, that's Bab's house. And then, and Bab is Barbara Streisand. Um, and I said, oh, Bab's. Uh, and so uh, we just became friends. And so she was very generous to write the foreword of the book. And actually I'm doing an Instagram live with her next on Holy Thursday at 1030 in the morning. So um, if anyone's interested in that, that should be fun on her new uh, production, Resurrection. Nice. Um, it's always interesting the connections we make um, along our lives. Right. So you the Holy to, Spirit. You should, ex exactly, exactly. So it's like, you know, there's Malibu Barbie, and then after my trip there, it's not going to be Malibu Bishop. <laughs> it's going to be, a, I'm sure it's a line of, of action figures that will take off. <laughs> that, that's too good. Um, so at the beginning of your talk, you shared uh, a little glimpse of the first chapter where you were talking about your first dog, um, Maggie, and, and what, you know, Maggie taught you about, you know, just going along with God's will. Um, what's another, like, what would be your, f well, how do I phrase this question? What was your favorite part of the book to write? Like, what chapter stood out to you the most and what you felt was the most impactful in what you wrote? Well, I think, um, well, I, that one always was very near and dear to my heart because I wrote it shortly thereafter, after I had to put Maggie down. Um, and then the, the book ends with five things I learned from my puppy, uh, who's now a, um, who's now a, a three-year-old dog, which I've written another one, um, five things I learned from my teenager. Um, and Zelly's the one, but the, so I think those ones, I've always um, had a, a fondness for, for dogs. And it's, it's funny because Zelly comes with me to all my visits, uh, the parish visits. So she's a high school kid or a kid from the confirmation class who's assigned to like hang out with her in the back pew. And, uh, and so, and people, and so when I was driving, I'll drive into parish and more often than not, someone will point and say, look, it's Zelly. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh yeah. And then there's that successor of the Abishop, you know, uh, uh, but uh, so I've always found them to be rather endearing, but I wrote them each separately. So it wasn't like I sat down and I was like, oh, Eureka, this chapter was brilliant. Uh, there was more sort of in the compilation of like putting them together and 
remembering and then be like, oh yes, I remember what inspired me to write that one or when Pope Benedict came. Um, so uh, that was the process. So in your book on chapter three, you break down facing terror. And in a sad way, that chapter is very relevant um, most days, um, especially, you know, this week in light of all of the horrific shootings that have gone on in our country. Um, can you talk a little bit more about that chapter specifically and how our audience can take those takeaways of, um, you know, eating together as a family, teaching your children about Jesus, uh, and, and the other um, takeaways that you give? How can we, you know, really take that chapter to heart this week? Right. You know, when I think about what original sin is, you know, that sort of inherited, I think of of, a, of an addicted baby who never took a drug in its life, but just ingested or a family where it's their systematic unhealthiness um, in the in, in generations, whether it be alcoholism or violence or something like that. Or where you just look at, um, you know, our, our, our culture now where, you know, we read about a 12 year old a 12 year old girl gets shot in Ward 8 in Anacostia in DC. And you're like, oh, that's so sad. And then you flip the page or scroll up to the next story. It's like, we realize that we live, what is it? What is this? It's a whole original sin is this infection that has taken charge and taken hold of us. And Jesus, through our baptism, it's he pulls us out of that muck and in the baptism, hoses us off and gets us clean and gives us the gift of faith, hope, and love. And basically says, none of this is normal. None of it. This is what I'm restoring you to, your vocation, your identity as a child of God. That's normal. That is what is you are called and who you're called to be. So I think we first and foremost have to look at with suspicious eyes at the world and realize we're never going to find the answer there. It's only in Jesus Christ, but it's Jesus Christ in the restoration of our vocation. You know, the first effect of original sin was shame. We could hate ourselves, and that we were naked, and we didn't like what we saw. And um, and if I can hate me, hello, I can hate you too. Uh, and that that migrates through the generations, and and then it's in Jesus Christ where we're restored to our right sense of identity, and thereby to right worship of God and having God be central in our lives. So um, I'm not even sure what your question was, but, but I do feel that the, uh, that the, that that's essential is to understand we are called out of the world and washed clean in baptism to be restored to our vocations as sons and daughters of God and let the world know that they are invited to the same. And it begins with each individual, you know, it begins in each family. Uh, and um, in our own hearts and in our own uh, in our own selves. So anything that is of that world, you know, we see so many people addicted to pornography or there's systematic things that just go on in a family and we need to say, no, 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 no. I have to stop it here and I have to stop it with the people I love and step forward to who I'm really called to be because that's how we're going to know joy. So we have a question from an audience member. They ask, you teach humor. Do you ever worry about the seriousness of your message gets lost? And why do not more people see religion as a cause for joy and happiness and lightheartedness? Right. Um, I, I, I'm i not sure. I think the reaction that I received from a lot of people from my book, which is, which is sort of lighthearted at first take, is um, that they reread it. They've found um, they found uh, meaning that's been deep in it so I don't know I, I I'm not seeking to be funny I'm seeking to be myself as I feel God has called me here comes Ellie back in the room um, and and so I, I just am myself and if that is uh, it's not meant to seem to be uh, Take to be simplistic or, or to just laugh at things, but to find joy. So I wouldn't say I'm necessarily funny as much as I am joyful. And maybe funniness is a byproduct of that. Um, That's so, a good distinction. 
And and I don't know what the second part of the question is. One second, let me pull it back up. Um, why do more people, why, why do not more people see religion as a cause for joy and happiness and lightheartedness? Well, I think that it's part of how, um, you, you know, I don't know. That's a good question. I, I, I don't know whether it's, you know, you don't have to be a, a, I taught homiletics for years and I always said to people, you don't have to be a big personality. You just have to be truthful, love people enough to tell them the truth. And, and so maybe it's one of those things where in, you know, the, the statistics show that like one of the weakest parts of people's Catholic experience is that the, that our preaching isn't so great. And there's a real lacuna in our own faith worship if our priests haven't prepared enough to draw us in. And it doesn't have to be funny. It doesn't have to be, uh, it, it, it just has to be um, truthful to the gospel and draw people more deeply into the mysteries of the Eucharist. So I, I hang it a lot of it on the shoulders of my brother priest that, um, you know, you don't have to be funny, you have to be sincere. And, and it also comes from a, a place of prayerfulness. I think that uh, if every priest, and this is what I'm calling my priest to in, in, in the Diocese of Springfield, to join me on a daily Eucharistic Holy Hour, therein lies all the perspective and all the, uh, the encounter to share the risen Lord with the people. And if you don't, if you're not spending time with the risen Lord, then you don't have much to share. And that our mission flows from our unity with the Lord. Our encounter with the Lord doesn't really happen primarily in our ministry, but it happens in our ministry when we have already known the Lord in prayer. Um, so I think that that is that's the that's the first thing I've asked my priest to do is to to join me in in praying an hour every day with the Lord. And if we did that, wow. Just think of the transformation that could happen. Um, so that's one of the things that I think. I love that. Um, at the CIC, we do an hour of adoration every, or we offer adoration for an hour every day, and hopefully longer once we're able to open up and invite more people into the chapel space. Right now, we're kind of constricted to a set capacity because of DC laws. Um, you know, mm. with we're having to do these virtual events, which are really great because we're able to, you know, connect with with individuals like you are joining us. You know, not from DC anymore. We miss you and hope you come back soon to visit. Um, but, you know, when trying to do, you know, an intellectual event um, or faith formation of it just in person, right now DC says, you know, we can have 10 people in a room, um, which really limits our ability to um, evangelize. Um, you know, one of our missions at the CIC is to evangelize professionals who live in and around the DC area. Um, so it really cooks my goose, though, because, hold on, they, because they allow you to. You, people are climbing each o over each other in the Home Depot. And, uh, yes. <laughs> and, and, you know, it's like they're all crowded around the Costco liquor section. And then you can't get around and have more than 10 people in a room that seats 120. What? Mm, I don't I'm going to put you on the spot here. What would be your five takeaways uh, from this last year of pandemic living? Well, I certainly think, you know, the, um, you know, number one is we need to get back to better. That there are lessons to be learned. And those lessons are, uh, it's five ways to get back to better. I would say one is we spend a lot of time with our families and I hope we're not itchy to get back out into the world and not be having a dinner with the, our family more often. Um, I, I think that it, uh, the second takeaway is we need to get back to real mass. If you said to, um, if you said to me, I'm hungry and I handed you a video of the Eucharist, well, that's not going to fill you, but being fed by Jesus himself. So 
we have to get back to to real life encounters and the streaming has to uh has to be dammed up to you know there's a place for the those homebound who generally cannot get to mass but even still that that needs to lead us back to getting eucharistic ministers to bring the eucharist um together um i think that uh, number three is that a sense of mortality is not such a bad thing the tradition of a memento mori of a reminder of death to remember that today's your last day um and could be so live it that way uh and so the fear of death uh is a terrible thing but if it keeps you from being alive today how tragic is that um another thing is is that we all did a lot of walking after we stopped eating as much in the refrigerator i was afraid that i would not die of covid but a frostbite of the face cuz my <laughs> head was in the refrigerator so much um and so to to maybe keep up some of those healthy habits um and number 5 is i think we've been made aware of the people that put themselves at risk every day before we even thought about covid these people in emergency rooms and emergency medical technicians and um our beloved liquor store employees all these frontline workers um and bakery personnel that these that these are people that do this every day and we need to have a sense of appreciation not just when there's a global pandemic so there's five five back to better with bishop burn alliteration I love that and the simplicity of it. And I mean that's the, you know, my biggest takeaway from the book is the simplicity of it. The just each point is an aha moment, right? Each chapter is kind of like that. The church is full of such beautiful and rich uh and and deep uh, you know, the- theology um and and ph- philosophy and you know and, and all that the church comes with. but sometimes and especially you know from my perspective as you know a non-cradle catholic who you know converted to catholicism um in college that it's sometimes just the simple aha moments you know like i th- i think it's chapter 4 in your book where you're talking about um the things not to forget about like not to take for granted of just like the joy in life um and i i love that i love the aha moments that it gives me and i hope that it gives the audience as well um and then again what you just said before you know how to get back to better you need to write an op-ed for that because it's very good and it's a very clear line um and yeah okay so i i just wrote a pastoral a pastoral letter for my diocese so you'll have to find see that when i'm done perfect perfect so we have another audience question and they want to know what's the best way to feel a sense of connection to the church when we are in this time of pandemic and social distancing and quarantine how can we use you know what's available to us to uh feel most connected to to Christ well i mean there are so many resources out there that are so uh wonderful and bishop baron you can't put him you know and the resources of just maybe taking the time to 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 read um my book that's the best way I never mind. <laughs> the other thing is is that you know even though you may not feel uh, able to attend mass for whatever reason um it doesn't mean that you can't experience uh visiting the church praying before the eucharist i kept my parish open every single day when i was in our lady of mercy in potomac and uh and there are so many places where and i and i encourage you we we have not seen any big outbreaks from people going to church so unless you have some serious serious comorbidity which a word i never used before but i've used more in the last 4 months um than ever and so but if you have some serious issues then stay away but be smart but i think we've kind of got it down and that people aren't getting uh the aren't getting the virus from going to church it's it's like having a rave on uh Miami Beach where you're going to get it that's why i've given that up <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh and just stay in church but that's it i think get back to church as soon as you can 
So, um, like we talked about a little at the beginning of this uh, lecture, you are new to the bishop world um, as a new bishop there in, in Springfield, Massachusetts. What are, you know, just a little insight for those at home, you know, what are your five takeaways as being a bishop? Like, what are some things that well, you weren't expecting? It's pretty, it's or pretty that... amazing. It's pretty amazing because there's absolutely zero onboarding. It's not like somebody shows up and says, hi, I'm the new bishop liaison. Welcome. And here's your binder. Um, so you sort of get <laughs> parachuted in. And luckily, I have lots of bishop friends. So I rely on them for advice frequently. But it is that's probably my most shocking um, that that you that you can become, you know, a, a spiritual CEO, and then uh, and then people are like, well, go ahead and do it. I mean, that sort of supports the theology. Nobody, well, Paul didn't have anybody to look around to when he was landing in Corinth. So I guess there's a certain availability to that. But uh, but that was sort of the that was sort of the funniest thing is because. You have to sort of figure this stuff out and figure it out quick. Um, so, uh, but I've also been uh, sort of delighted by how warmly I've been received and how uh, gracious and generous people are. And, uh, and so that's very exciting. Um, and so I, I feel like I, I have the, the one thing about that made me a, becoming a bishop, I thought I was really relying on the Lord before, and now I'm really relying on the Lord. And uh, and that's why that Eucharistic Holy Hour, it also uh, dispels the, the, the demons that come at night when you're feeling sort of alone and far away from people you know and love. And then you go to the, I go to the Blessed Sacrament, he's like, Hello, you're not alone and you're not far away from your people you love because I'm here right next to you and right with you. I'm here in the Eucharist and, uh, and so, and like lean in, lean in. Um, and that also means leaning into uh, reaching out to other bishops to, to get insights. Um, so I think that's it. The fact is, is that if you want to make some money, maybe you could start the bishop's onboarding manual. I'll, I'll be right. <laughs> That's too good. Um, I've been in the um, Army Reserves for some time now and uh, can definitely relate to the, uh, we call it uh, in processing. Um, and they try to do a checklist, right. but most of the time you're just kind of trying to figure it out all on your own. And on the, you know, spiritual Catholic side, I probably wouldn't, you know, I think it's safe to assume a lot of Catholics might feel you know, that they're having to figure it out all on their own, like how to be a good Catholic. And I know there's all these resources out there when you when you take the time and you go and look. But for some, I mean, it could be kind of overwhelming, um, the amount of resource or resources and, and teachings uh, that the church does has. I mean, we've been around for over 2,000 years. Um, where right. for someone who's, you know, maybe laxed in their faith the last, you know, few years or fallen away, and if, you know, if there was someone like that's watching this right now or um, someone at home who has a, you know, a friend um, in that situation or family member, what would you recommend to them to, as a, as the first resource um, to give to that um, uh, well, you know, family member? Well, I would think that the, the sooner and the fast, the sooner and the faster you connect to a community, the, the better off you are. So, um you know, to look into your local parish. And if they're if they're making, you know, Ziploc baggy sandwiches to bring to the poor that are COVID friendly, sign up, uh, get to know people, begin to build community. And so many of the parishes, especially in the Washington DC area, are continually running different kinds of programs, whether it be Bible studies or book studies. And, and if you're not um, uh, initially uh, comfortable, then Call up Father Charles Trios and um, and ask if you can meet with him because he's awesome. And I, I'll give you his cell phone number right now in his private room. <laughs> no, <laughs> just call the CIC. <laughs> um, but but I think the quicker that you can communicate, I mean, connect with a uh, a community, um, the better off you are. We we would run at the parish at Our Lady of Mercy. 
landings, which is the most barrier free entrance way into uh, rediscovering the faith where there are no bad questions. And that kind of stuff is going on all over. So I think I would do a little, some go some deep dives on Google and see what's going on in the local parishes. Find out, uh, reach out to people that you know that are, um, that are more engaged and just see if you can go with them so you don't have to do it alone. Well, um, I, we have time for maybe one more question um, before we have to go here today. Um, but I, I'm curious, what's your, like, what do you want for the audience to be the main takeaway from your book? Uh, I think that we, uh, St. John Paul II said, we are a resurrection. We're an Easter people and, and Alleluia is our song. Um, that we can't get stuck on Calvary. We got to pop out of an empty tomb and realize that that's the resurrection is the source of all of our hope and if we don't live in the bask in the light of the resurrected Christ calling us to new life to rebuild the new heaven and new earth then we've missed the point um, and so what what I I'm hoping is is that they will um, discover the joy that the resurrection brings and the freedom the freedom that comes from that um, that comes through the life of the sacraments and the reconciliation and the newness of life and being fed by the Eucharist um, I think it's one of those things where if we just it's kind of a Ruby Slippers uh, Wizard of Oz movie <clears throat> I've always found that to be kind of frustrating that uh, uh, that she's like gone through the movie and then they're like, you know, they've had the monkey flying monkeys attack her and the trees throwing apples at her and the green soldiers and and then all of a sudden they're like, oh yeah, by the way, oh, you just have to click your heels. <laughs> and you're like, what? I had to get a monkey, a flying monkey? Those flying monkeys freaked me out when I was little. I think they still do. But the idea is that you, we've all wear the ruby slippers there. It's the gifts of faith, hope, and love in our baptism. So start living it with a big smile on your face. I love that. The faith, hope, and love uh, as being represented by the Ruby Slippers. Um, so for those of you watching at home, be sure to pick up your copy of, uh, of Bishop Burns' new book. Um, unfortunately, at the CAC, we're sold out right now. It's very popular, um, and we're going to be ordering more. Uh, but you can uh, pick up your copy at Amazon or, you know, where other Catholic books are sold. And for those, uh, Father Bill, correct me if I'm, I'm wrong, but you have also translated this book into like a YouTube series. Um, as a resource for people, is that correct? The YouTube series was first. The YouTube okay. series was first. So if you go on and do five, go to YouTube, Five Things with Father Bill, you'll see a bunch of YouTube. And also we have, I've been doing uh, Instagram spiritual shorts. They're on YouTube also and on Instagram. I think they're on our Facebook page. I'm at Bishop W.D. Burn at I mean, Instagram, Bishop W.D. Burn, uh, B-Y-R-N-E. Uh, so there's been a whole bunch of, I've been doing every day a, 37, 30 second Lenten um, reflection. I'm probably going to keep it up as just a daily, every day there'll be a spiritual short. I love that. Staying up with the times. And I mean, social media is always changing, you know, as a communications director. Mm -hmm. I, I can't tell you. And the you point of the thing, <laughs> more about that. the point of the thing, I, I end all of them to say, now get off your phone. Because we need to use social media to gather people in. But then the ultimate goal is to get them off and get them alive. Oh, that's so true. Get off your phone, get off your computers, and just go live your faith with your community. Um, thank you again, Bishop Byrne, for, for taking the time out of your very busy schedule to talk to our audience. You know, we really miss you here in Washington, D.C. Um, congratulations you on your book and, as your, and on your appointment. And for those of you watching at home, thank you again for taking the time out of your busy days uh, to watch another CIC book lecture and stay up to date on all that the CIC has to offer you by signing up for our email uh, listserv, which you can do um, below in the video description and stay up to date on all that the CIC has to offer you. Thank you.